Um, the reason why I decided to come to Project Veritas is because um, people need to know what's actually going on with Google. There's this facade about what they're doing, but what they're actually doing, what the employees are actually seeing inside the company is different. But the reason we launched our AI principles is because people were not putting that line in the sun, but they were not saying what is fair and what's equal. So we're like, well, we are a big company, we're going to say it. The people who voted for the current president do not agree with our definition of fairness. They're not objective piece. They're not an objective source of information. But then there are teams uh, which are called ML Fairness. ML Fairness, the teams? Fairness, like, yeah. you know, you need to be fair. We're also training our algorithms, like, if 2016 happened again, would we have, would the outcome be different? They are a highly biased political machine um, that is bent on never letting somebody like Donald Trump come to power again. But 2020 is certainly on top of now my own organization trust and safety is top of mind. They've been working on it since 2016 to make sure we're ready for 2020. This is a Goliath I'm but of David trying to say that the Emperor has no clothes. He got called in front of Congress multiple times. They can pressure us but not changing. Being a small little ant I can be crushed and I'm aware of that but this is something that is bigger than me. This is something that needs to be said to the American public. What? Elizabeth Warren is saying that yeah. we should break up Google. And like, I love her, but she is very misguided. Like, that will not make it better, it will make it worse. Because now all these smaller companies who don't have the same resources that we do will be charged with preventing the next Trump situation. It's like a small company cannot do it. And it's like... Earlier this year, a Facebook insider exposed de-boosting of conservatives on Facebook. That insider inspired someone at Pinterest to come to Project Veritas with his story. Last week, we released a report from the Pinterest insider Eric Cochran detailing censorship of pro-life and Christian content. The tech companies can't fight us all. Today, we bring you a Google insider a brave man who came forward and brought us a story that will scare you. I think sunlight is the best disinfectant and people need to start asking questions. A couple weeks before the Google Insider came forward, Project Veritas secretly recorded with Jen Janai, a Google executive. Janai talks about making sure when people search for things through machine learning algorithms, Google's political agenda is always present. We all got screwed over in 2016. Again, it wasn't just us. Right. It was like people got screwed over. The news media got screwed over. Like everybody got screwed over. So now we're rapidly being like, what happened there? How do we prevent it from happening again? Right after Donald Trump won the election in 2016, the company did a complete 180 in uh, what they thought was important. Before they thought self-expression and giving everyone a voice was important, but uh, now they're like, hey, there's a lot of hate, and because of there's a lot of hate and misogyny and racism, that's the reason why Donald Trump got elected. And so we need to uh, fix that. And we need to start policing our users because we don't like to have an outcome uh, like that. We don't want to have an outcome like that to happen again. Yeah, let's, let's, let's talk a little about that. Um, so, um, tell me more about what you observed at these meetings right after Trump was elected. Who said it? What was said exactly? So the, the things that changed was that the TJFs, they started talking about the need to combat hate and racism online and also um, at YouTube. They had the same like talks by the CEO, Susan, um, and they, they, they talked about combating that and getting rid of unfairness. And so slowly they started introducing uh, the concept of uh, machine learning fairness. Jen Janai is the head of responsible innovation at Google Global Affairs. She determines policy and ethics for machine learning or artificial intelligence. What we've learned is that AI is increasingly what Google search is all about. But the reason we launched our AI principles is because people were not putting that line in the sun. They were not saying what is fair and what's equal. So we're like, well, we are a big company. We're going to say it. Where my definition of fairness and bias specifically talks about uh, 
historically marginalized communities, and that's who I care about. Communities who are communities who are in power and have traditionally been in power are not who I'm solving fairness for. Our definition of fairness is one of those things that we thought would be like obvious and everybody would agree to. And it won't. Like there are the same people who voted for the current president do not agree with our definition of fairness. Fairness is a dog whistle. It does not mean what you think that it means, and you have to apply double think in order to understand what they're really saying. And what they're really saying about fairness is that they have to manipulate their search results so that it gives them their political agenda that they want. And so they have to rebias their algorithms so that they can uh, they can get their agenda across. You know, to unpack everything that she's saying, saying that she wants to be, she wants the algorithm to be fair to a, a, a hand-picked representative of that community means that what she's trying to do is she's trying to sell you a product that is not objectionable. It's, what she's trying to do is she's trying to sell a product that's not objective, that doesn't represent the will of its users, but instead represents the will of a, of a, of a group of people making decisions behind the shadows. So what did you find inside Google? that was related to this idea of fairness? What I found at Google related to fairness was a machine learning algorithm called ML fairness, ML standing for machine learning. And fairness, meaning whatever it is that they wanted to find as fair. You could actually think of fairness as unfair because it's um, taking as input the clicks that people are making and then figuring out which signals are being generated from those clicks and which signals it wants to amplify and then also dampen. So I have google.com up in front of me and I'm gonna try to put this AI machine learning thing to the test. I'm going to type in the following words, men can, and I see Men can have babies, men can get pregnant, men can have periods, men can cook. Do most people search for that stuff or what is the company doing internally? You no, know, people, people aren't searching for this. This is, this is literally coming from source of truth databases that they've selected represent the truth and that they are pulling this information from. And then we try it again with, let's try this with women can. I don't see I see women can vote, women can do it, women can do anything, women can be drafted. Yes. That seems a little interesting. So all these examples are, um, are part of the social justice narrative, right? And so the sources of truth that ML Fairness is selecting from to amplify um, are saying these keywords. And, and so because that source of truth has been vandalized, the output of the algorithm is also reflecting that vandalism. Project Veritas also received a trove of confidential documents from within Google. This document is about algorithmic unfairness. It reads, quote, for example, imagine that a Google image query for CEOs shows predominantly men. Even if it were a factually accurate representation of the world, it would be algorithmic unfairness, unquote. Gorov Gite, a Google software engineer, independently verified the thesis of this document. But then there are teams uh, which are called ML Fairness. ML Fairness, the teams? Fairness, like, yeah. you know, you need to be fair. Yeah. So they're trying to modify the model such that even if the data for a female CEO is it's it's low. not yet, it's low. It's kind yeah. of balances out. It so balances out. Now this is a, a confidential document, correct? Yes. This is not a document that Google has come out and admitted uh, that this is their process. That's correct. Um, and in this in this document, it says I'm going to read from it. In fact, in fact, if you brought this up without the document, they would say that this is a conspiracy theory. Wow. So then they wouldn't admit this publicly. They would never admit this publicly. In, in this document, it says, in some cases, it may be appropriate to take no action if the system accurately affects current reality, while in other cases, 
it may be desirable to consider how we might help society reach a more fair and equitable state via product intervention. What do they mean by that? So what they want to do is they want to act as gatekeepers between the user and the content that they're trying to access. And so they're going to come in, they're going to filter the content and they're going to say, oh, actually, we don't want to give the user access to that information because it's going to create a, a, an outcome that's undesirable to us. So this was an internal only Google document, which says the goal is to establish, quote, a single point of truth for definition of news across Google products, unquote. What does this, what does this mean? Um, when they mean single point of truth, what they mean is alignment with the narrative. And so the narrative come, is manufactured by um, establishment players and what they're looking to do is they're looking to boost authoritative content. Accusations on random fairness is that we're unfair to conservatives because we are choosing what we define as credible news sources and those news sources don't necessarily overlap with conservative sources. And so we're getting accusations on fair from one side. Does Google have an editorial agenda? Uh, does the company make news decisions? Is that what I'm seeing in this document? Yes. Um, this is describing what's happening within the, with, the, with Google News. Would Google have a problem if people saw this document? Yeah, I think so. Why wouldn't Google want people to see this document? Uh, the reason why is because um, right here, um, in uh, some of these boxes, they're applying um, editorial, uh, their, their editorial agenda onto uh, the news sources. And if you were to expand that, you would see that there's uh, machine learning uh, fairness within these uh, algorithmic checks. And they state right here that it's for crawlability and extractability, but in reality, it's, 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 does it doesn't fall in line with their, um, with their agenda. And if it does, it, it pops to the top, and if it doesn't, then it gets buried. Other internal documents expose Google's hopes for ML fairness. Training data are collected and classified. Algorithms are programmed. Media are filtered, ranked, aggregated, and generated. People, like us, are programmed. Sounds like social engineering, not search querying. Google's power has become a political issue, with politicians on both sides of the aisle debating whether antitrust legislation or other regulations and controls are in order. I got called in front of Congress multiple times and we've not shown up because we're like, we just know they're going to just attack us. Like, we're not going to change our response, we're not going to change our mind. There's no point in just sitting there being attacked for something that we know we're not going to change. Like, they can pressure us, but we're not changing. Like Elizabeth Warren, even I love her, but she's also saying like you just have to break up Google and that will solve everything. You have to what? Elizabeth Warren is saying that yeah. we should break up Google. And like I love her, but she is very misguided. Like that will not make it better. It will make it worse because now all these smaller companies who don't have the same resources that we do will be charged with preventing the next Trump situation. It's like a small company cannot. Do and it's like the White House. Right now, there's a lot of chatter in Washington, D.C., antitrust discussions and legislation being mentioned about breaking up Google. How do your bosses or the people that you work with inside of Google feel about that? Um, for the most part, they're, they're ignoring it. To them, it's not even happening. Um, they don't see it as a real threat because it's something that's already happened before and passed. She just said what Google's really thinking, and they won't say in public, but she just said, you know, what a lot of us see and know to be true. And you guys just got her and she was just, she just said the truth. They're not an objective piece, they're not an objective source of information. 
They are a highly biased political machine um, that is bent on never letting somebody like Donald Trump come to power again. Hmm. 2020 is certainly on top of now my old organization, Trust and Safety, is top of mind. They've been working on it since 2016 to make sure we're ready for 2020. So training our algorithms, like if 2016 happened again, would we have, would the output, output be different? It's unclear what Janai is exactly referring to, but Google's political agenda is undeniable. What are some other things I can type here? Hillary Clinton's emails are... It doesn't even, it doesn't even give you a result. Google is suggesting that people do not search for this term. Is that correct? That's what they're saying. It's not even worth returning any results. But people do search for this. Absolutely. And you can tell that because you can cross-reference some of their other services that prove that people are. If you want to get an example, go to trends.google.com. Okay, I'll do that right now. Trends.google.com. And uh, shall I? Hillary Clinton's emails, yes. Okay, and set it to the, la the last five years. Seems like we had a spike in October of 2016. It says 100. I guess that is that a hundred. It's all relative. So in order to get an idea of the relative importance of this, you're going to want to compare it against another search term. Let's type in Donald Trump's emails. Okay. Show me what I'm looking at here. So what we see right here is relative to the search term of Hillary Clinton's emails, Donald Trump's emails has no search traffic. No search traffic. Now let's go back to Google.com and search for Donald Trump's emails, and it should show us no autocomplete because, according to Google, no one searches for it compared to Hillary Clinton's emails. But it does. It gives us a whole bunch of different examples for autocomplete. So nobody's, fewer people search for this, and it autocompletes, and everyone searches for Hillary Clinton's email, and it doesn't. That's right. What's the explanation? Well, according to them, Hillary Clinton's emails is a conspiracy theory and it's unfair to return results based on her emails. And so through their program of ML Fairness, they've deleted the autocomplete off the internet like it didn't even exist. How did they do that? Was it manually? Was it a human being? Was it a, was it, was it a machine? AI? Well, the way that it works is that they're training the AI now with uh, a human, with a bunch of humans that you could consider them social justice warriors or whatever you want to label them, but they are feeding the information and training the AI so that it will uh, return results like this. And when they aren't able to, um, to, to train it, there's actually something that will, someone that will go through and manually delete certain keyword terms or put it as a blacklist. There's a lot of people filing bugs internally against Google, like against these invalid results, and they ignore them because they've got no interest in fixing uh, things that go against their social justice narrative or uh, reduce what they consider to be fair. Google is protected by Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. It says, quote, no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider, unquote. Meaning, Google is not liable for any content on their platform. Some people think a solution is this Section 230 and taking it away. I mean, they violated not only the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law. Section 230 uh, says that in order for them to be a platform, they can't censor the content uh, that they have. And instead, they decided to act as a publisher, making them responsible for everything that they put on. And they're still masquerading as a platform, even though they're acting as a publisher. It doesn't stop with Google search. Our insider says political biases are censoring voices on YouTube, owned by Google as well. 
He says the YouTube rollout discussion was at a rather bizarre location. It didn't happen, it was a special occasion that happened um, uh, in May, and they, um, they invited us all to the Masonic Temple to talk about the future of the company uh, for YouTube, and they described that they were going to have more content filtering and right after that happened, um, a lot of the content creators started to get demonetized um, and their uh, videos started to get deranked. I'm talking about um, Dave Rubin, um, talking about Carpe Diem, talking about Tim, uh, Tim Pool, um, and a lot of the other content creators that are within the YouTube ecosystem just saw their, 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 their view counts just go through the floor. What did YouTube do to make their view counts go down? So Google is targeting what they consider to be right-wing news commentators. So that includes um, Tim Pool, Dave Rubin, Stephen Crowder, and a host of other right-wing people that they are coming in and they're deciding that they don't want these opinions to have a wide appeal. And so they're coming in and they're putting their thumb down and they're deciding which content the users are allowed to see. The way that Google is able to target people is that they take videos and then they do a uh, transliteration through using artificial intelligence. And they look at the translated text of what those people are saying, and then they assign certain categories to them, like right-winger or, um, or, or, or news talk. And then they're able to, to take those and apply their algorithmic rebiasing unfairness algorithms to them so that their content is suppressed across the platform. Specifically, the insider verified that PragerU, the conservative educational YouTube channel, and talk show host Dave Rubin's videos received heightened analysis in the artificial intelligence program Viacon. Viacon polices YouTube distribution, singling Prager and Rubin out as right-wing and news talk. So they're applying narrative control. What's scary about this to you? What's scary is that Google's deciding what's important and what's not important. Um, they are going through and they're effectively deleting conversations from the, the, the national narrative. It reminds me of a book called 1984, and that should have been a warning. 1984 should not be a user manual on how to run society. And Google's falling directly into that trap where they're deciding what gets read, what gets consumed, what people are able to click on, what appears. Um, you know, it reminds me a lot of fascism. Like, you know, it's not just about burning books. When videos get pulled off of a platform, that's also a form of censorship. I've been living this for, um, you know, years and so you know it's like yeah that's what it is and for other people it's shocking but for me it's like this is why i'm coming forward hmm. because it is shocking and people have no idea that it's happening and they still think that google is an objective source of information and it's not are you afraid um i am afraid um i was more afraid but um i i had a lot of difficulty with the concept of uh you know, my life ending because of this. But um, I, I imagine what the other world would look like and it's not a place that I'd want to live in. What do you think is gonna happen next for you? Um, uh, hopefully I get away with it and uh, nothing bad happens, but um, bad things can happen. I mean, this is a behemoth, this is a Goliath, I'm but a David trying to say that the emperor has no clothes. And um, being a small little ant, I can be crushed and I'm aware of that. But this is something that is bigger than me. This is something that needs to be said to the American public. This year, insiders approached Project Veritas and told their stories, exposing the giants in Silicon Valley. Thanks to the bravery and courage these insiders are showing, big tech, is being held accountable. This is a watershed moment. It's not the New York Times or CBS News doing the work. It's individual citizens, anonymous heroes who put their careers on the line 
and they've struck a nerve and found their voice at Project Veritas. People always ask me, what can I do? You can follow the lead of Eric Cochran and the Google Insider. You too can be brave, wear a camera, and contact us securely at projectveritas.com brave.